ghostly baby sits on a grave. Translucent figure descends a staircase. A child's face emerges from a devastating fire. Do this picture offer a real glimpse of ghosts? Or is that a more rational explanation about ghost photography? I'm Dom, and today we're going to discover together the history of ghost photography and its mysteries. Salve a tutti and welcome to the first episode of Odd Curiosities, a new series that has started today and which will discover interesting and odd facts, history and mysteries. Today we're going to talk about ghost photography or, as it is originally called, spirit photography. The history of ghost photography is closely tied to the history of photography itself. Early photography was a new technology in that enthusiasts had to become skilled with the various equipment and chemicals that were needed to develop images or photos. Before the invention of photographic film, the photographers worked with chemically treated glass plates, which were cleaned and reused for new images. But if they weren't properly cleaned, the image, the old image, could have been still seen in new photos, in new images. Now, before we dive into the story of the early spirit photographers, it is important to talk about the cultural stage upon which they performed. The spread of photography was happening simultaneously to the rise of a new belief system called spiritualism. The main ideas of spiritualism centered around the belief that dead people continued to exist as spirits and their consciousness continued to be here on earth on this planet even after they died. Interaction with the spirits was said to be possible through the use of psychics or mediums. Spiritualism began in the 1840s and grew to the 20th century, gaining millions of followers. In the wake of the growing movement, ideas such as parlor sense grew very, very popular. And it was quite easy to find people who believed openly in the spiritualism and spirits as a scientific reality. A large number of people who wanted to believe in life after death made it possible for mediums to open shops, a quite large number of shops, in the northeast of the United States. It was in this environment that Boston photographer William Mumler introduced spirit photography to a community that was hunger and eager to have more proof of life after death. Mumler had been a jeweler engraver before he began his career as a spirit photographer all started with a single self-portrait photo in which is shown a relative that died well long before the picture was taken. In a time when photography was already an expensive proposition for a family looking for a portrait, Mumler was able to fetch several times more the normal cost of a photograph for one of his special portraits which would show a ghostly image of some dead loved one along with a mundane image of the living subject. It is not hard to understand why 19th century Americans in love with the spiritualism movement would have believed that those photographic apparitions were real. Even if high-profile skeptics such as Barnum devalued spirit photography as a scam. When spirit photography appeared in the 1860s, the United States was reeling from the Civil War, which claimed an astonishing 620,000 lives. Deep in mourning, Americans were drawn to anyone who was able to offer even a brief connection to the soul of the dearly departed. Self-proclaimed mediums performed meetings in which the living could speak with the dead, and photographers like Mumler granted the wishes of the mourning person to see their lost brother or sons one last time. Mumler had an act for self-promotion, and his otherworldly photo was written up in spiritualist magazines like The Banner of Light and also in the mainstream media. Bostoners began to lining up at a small portrait studio to pay as much as $10 for a photo of their lost loved ones. Mumbler sold himself as someone who could not explain what was happening or why he was chosen to take these pictures. He was astonished, as anyone else, that his suddenly his camera could take pictures of ghosts. A visitor to Mumbler's studio was told that there was no guarantee that a departed soul would appear. Mumler didn't command the spirits, they came and went as they pleased. And if a picture didn't come up as expected, an old woman 
instead of a lost brother or son, perhaps. Mumler was helping the client investigating their memories to discover which other ghost would have been eager to communicate with the living. Since photography was a new invention in the 19th century, few people had other images to compare with the faint blurry image of the ghost. Did great aunt Winifred wear a bun? Probably. Mumler's spirit photography attracted skeptics from the beginning. Manipulating images was a well-known part of the photographic art form, and all the photographers were openly experimenting with double exposure or superimposed negatives, all of which could create the effect of Mumler's spirit photography. If Mumler was pushing the medium into plain metaphysics, his colleagues wanted to know how or expose him as a fraud. A number of investigators visited Mumler's to verify his methods, and most were convinced that they were legitimate. Success encouraged Mumler, and he expanded the operation into a mail order service. <laughs> Send a description of the spirit you hope to see, plus $7.50, and you too could see ghost, or, as one spiritualist put it, hold intercourse with mortals. Then, an unexpected visitor to the studio identified one of the ghosts as his wife. Not a problem, you say, in the face of it, except his wife was still alive, and that posed at Mumler's gallery well in advance of this otherworldly turn. The skeptics began to outnumber the believers, and Mumler, scared by the loss of faith, eventually moved to New York, where he set up a new shop in 1868. But then a skeptical news reporter investigate and convinced the major of New York to pursue fraud charges against Mumler. A defraud operation took place and Mumler was arrested and put on trial. The trial of William Mumler was a spectacle that included testimony from Barnum, whose cynical and amusing testimony against Mumler often brought the proceeding to a halt as the courtroom erupted in a laugh. Barnum had written about the deceptive methods of spirit photographers in a book titled The Humbugs of the World, explaining that photographs of famous statesmen had been made by the photographer, inserting indistinct reproduction from famous paintings through multiple exposure techniques. In the trial, Mumler was criticized and mocked, but the prosecutors failed to demonstrate his fraud, and he was not found guilty, though he was financially destroyed. Mumler moved back to Boston in his final years. Although retired from spirit photography, he couldn't resist one last high-profile client, Mary Todd Lincoln. Mumler's grim portrait of the widowed first lady depicted an ethereal ape resting two comforting hands on her shoulder. The picture exemplifies the peace and comfort to the tired soul that Mumler trumpeted as his old hallmark. He saw himself as a seller of the bright, bright rays of the spiritual sun. If his more credulous customers were too eager to relax in those rays, well, who could blame them? In the pain of grief, no one asked why the clouds are parting. But Mumbler has created something good for modern journalism. He invented a technique called the Mumbler process that allowed the first photographs to be printed in newsprints, changing the practice of journalism in what we know today. Craig and I discussed about Mumler and spirit photography on his channel in a video where we discussed about the medium and psychic point of view. And you can see the link on the video right here or in the description down below. And we discussed about the thousands of pictures that he received in the past and keeps receiving today and how he as a medium and psychic sees and understands this picture or which explanation he can give about these pictures. But if you want to see more, just follow up with the link in the description or up here. Go on Craig's channel, have a look at the video. And if you are interested in medium psychics, then follow up with them. That's pretty interesting. And most of the videos, well, most of the latest videos are edited and filmed by me. So here I will explain you how I made them. There you can see how they look like. From Mumler's era comes a variety of pictures that show ectoplasm emerging from nostril or mouth of mediums. To the modern viewer, there is a little mystery about these photos. They show obvious fraud, but at the time, many people saw them as a proof of the paranormal as scientific reality. But these early cases show just one kind of ghost photo, deliberate 
fraud for profit. There are other type of course photographs and still today they are making the front page of some tabloid newspaper and even 24 hours news networks. Let's take a look at the most common examples. Glowing dots flowed in the image, but when the picture was taken, there was nothing there. And some of these glowing shapes even seem to have a face in them. They are called orbs. Once the darling of the paranormal world, more and more researchers today are recognize these for what they really are. Dust particle illuminated by the camera flash. What about the allergic face in them? We'll get to that in a minute. Perhaps the most common cause for ghost photos. A picture is taken and in the shadow of a window, the image of a face or a mysterious human-like figure appears. Why didn't the photographer notice when the picture was taken? Science has a term for this and so do amateur ghost hunters. In scientific terms, it's called pareidolia which describes the human tendency to see faces when there are none. Such faces are called simulacra. It is a type of apophenia, which is the human tendency to find patterns and meaning in chaos. It is also the source of cryptozoology, fairy, angel and saints photos. Occasionally orb photos show tiny smiley faces made from random pixels. For reasons unclear to me, paranormal enthusiasts started to use the term matrixing to describe the same phenomena. Eerie, luminous, blue, ghostly image caught on surveillance video last Sunday. In November 2007, a security video at an Ohio gas station went viral after being picked up by multiple news organizations. Blurry, semi-translucent image moved around on the video and seems to fly through objects at the gas station but did not seem to be picked up by the owners or the people around it. The media coverage was mostly uncritical and just seemed to ask, was this a ghost? Researchers were able to identify the source as an insect walking on the lens of the camera. This kind of easily explained video phenomena come up again and again from fixed location security cameras. The effect is caused when the insect walks on the lens of the camera and produce blurred images. Spider, moths and ladybugs have all been misdiagnosed and ghosts in this kind of videos. With the popularity of digital photography, these kind of errors are becoming rarer and rarer, but in film-based cameras it was sometimes possible to accidentally shoot the same piece of film twice without moving to the next frame. In most cases, the results would be easily recognized as garbage when the two merged images were developed. Occasionally, a merged image would result in a ghostly figure or a face of a deceased one that was photographed when it was still alive, who then showed up in a later photograph as a multiple exposure artifact. Many ghost photos from the early 20th centuries resulted when the photographer took photos with long exposure settings and someone moved through the scene. This type of photo can show a faded figure a bit like the multiple exposure one, but the telltale sign of this kind of photo is when the ghostly figure is repeated or motion blurred as they pass through the frame of the shot. Ghost hunting on a cold winter night can often produce a creepy looking fog that nobody noticed when the shot was taken. But if the photographer was alive and the air was cold, there is a good chance that as the photo was taken, it captured the foggy bread that comes with these shooting conditions. These foggy patches sometimes catch even the camera flash and create weird shapes and figures, but those are not ghosts. Many ghost photos are shared and published because the photographer says that there was nobody in the frame when the photo was taken. This is quite common on photos where the photographer was taking a picture of an amazing building or a beautiful landscape. 
The photo turns out, but it shows some unexpected figure or person that was unremembered. Human memory is very, very poor, and when we are focused on a particular activity, we are not really good at remembering background details. Strangers in the background of a photo taken in a touristic area are much more likely to be unnoticed visitors rather than visitors from beyond the grave. Sadly, this is a really common source for many famous ghost photos. The hurt to hoax a photo can be done for fame, profit, or many other reasons. Some people see ghost photos as a way to support the believing ghost, and in this sense, like people who fake miracles, a ghost photo can be a type of dedicated fraud. But there are many tabloids out there that will pay good money for a new ghost photo. And this temptation is enough to create hoax. People will also create hoax because it entertains them to fool other people. But not all ghost photos are explainable with the reasons and example that we have just done. There are photos out there that are still waiting for an explanation, for a scientific or reasonable explanation, and cannot be dismissed so simply. The world is a big place and life is a big mystery. And we shouldn't stop at the first glance of a supposed ghost picture. We should see them through the eyes of a skeptic. These to remove all the mentioned possible reasons. And all in this way, we'll be able to find one good picture. And trust me, out of hundreds of thousands of pictures you will see in, out there on the internet or that will be given to you, there will be at least one that cannot be explained. And with this, we conclude the first episode of Odd Curiosities. New episode will come out soon. And if you found this interesting and you want to see more of it, just click the subscribe button and the little bell. If you want to discuss about ghost photography or photography in general or odd curiosities, you can leave a comment down below or you can find me on Twitter. And if you are interested in mediumship and psychics and predictions and future, or you want to see how I'm making these videos, you can follow up Craig on his channel. I'll leave the link up there and in the description down below. And with this, I'll thank you all for your time. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Alla prossima. Ciao.